Hello everyone, welcome back to another reaction video. Today we are taking a look at the next part in the unbiased history of Rome by Dovati. Today we are looking at the Tetrarchy and Diocletian's reign specifically. And this is where the crisis of the 3rd century will finally end and we'll get to meet one of Rome's greatest emperors. So without further ado, let's get going. This is the Friends intro song, right? I never watched the show, but I recognized the song. Opia, Severina, Diocletian, Maximian, yes, yes. All the key actors are here. Good. Nobody didn't miss anyone. <laughs> Probos, hell yeah, that's my man. Probos. These intros keep getting better. <laughs> the restorer of the world was betrayed. After saving the empire from decades of civil war and barbarian invasions, Aurelian's death was mourned by all. Yes, uh, where we last left off, Aurelian, the restitutor orbis, the restorer of the world, had uh, been assassinated by his officers who were acting on a false rumor that Aurelian was planning to conduct a purge within the officer ranks. And, uh, of course, this is a great shame, uh, really is. Uh, Aurelian really was a fantastic general who defeated the Palmarine and the Gallic Empire and put the empire back together. He also defeated a whole cadre of various barbarian tribes. And he had begun very important domestic reforms, which uh, fortunately Diocletian will continue to some extent. And uh, he also built the Aurelian Walls, which is perhaps uh, one of his longer lasting legacies. And uh, yeah, now we're in a situation again where the Empire has, uh, well, where the Imperial Throne is vacant. And it needs to be filled. And uh, yeah, it, it will result in some unusual uh, uh, maneuvering by the army and the senate, respectively. When the catastrophe was relayed to the legions, they were consumed with the most anguished sorrow and direst anger. All of Aurelian's assassins were then rounded up and subjected to the worst tortures known to man. They then sent word to Rome, expressing that none of the officers felt worthy enough to follow on Aurelian's steps. And I can't stress how unusual this was. Uh, the army at this point almost always picked the emperor. And that's why we had all of these barracks emperors during the crisis of the third century. Uh, but in this case, apparently the officers felt so much shame and guilt over killing their great leader and emperor that they actually deferred the pick of the next emperor to the Senate. Now, as we've already mentioned several times throughout this series, the power of the Senate is functionally ceremonial at this point, and they really never um, wielded much influence again, but this was their last hurrah when they finally uh, again got to pick an emperor without the army's interference, which is very strange indeed and it um i think it says something about the greatness of aurelian that uh, they wouldn't pick any new emperor for whatever reason guilt or shame depression and rage the only thing in their minds the senate in turn was horrified at the prospect of having to elect the next emperor given who he would have to live up to so they begged the legions to choose one for them which they refused they begged again, were refused again, and this back and forth continued for months. And as it did, during the interregnum, Aurelian's wife, Opia Severina, ruled Rome, the first and only empress of the whole Roman Empire. Yes, so according to the old historiography, uh, Opia Severina, Aurelian's um, Augusta, the empress, 
uh, apparently ruled in her own right during the interregnum when the senate and army couldn't pick a successor to Aurelian. And now more modern scholarship um, casts some doubts about this and they suggest that uh, there was in fact little to no interregnum and that uh, Opinia Severina never ruled in her own right. Uh, as usual with the crisis of the 3rd century, our sources are very sketchy and uh, we often lack reliable information or information at all. So uh, we can't really tell how it was. Uh, it would have been quite something if she did uh, rule in her own right, because uh, women having power was not in the Roman uh, DNA, so to speak. Liar. Did I say that she had a daughter of Aurelian? Because she did. Not that it will be relevant, I assure you. So what can we say about our little Augusta over here? Well, for starters, she wasn't a Severan. Forget the last name. Instead, she was related to Trajan's line, as the first Impressive. name Impressive. She was Trajan's a line. survivor too, so if a woman ever deserved to rule Rome, Opia is as good as it gets. And what did Opia do with all of her power? Absolutely fuck all. Refusing to take advantage of her husband's death and just printing coins for fun while waiting for a successor to be chosen. So after eight months of back and forth, the Senate relented and decided to pull a Nerva and elect a highly capable old geezer as emperor, Marcus Tacitus, a full-blooded descendant of the good historian. Yes, uh, so whatever the case, if there was an interregnum or not, uh, the fact is the Senate did manage to pick a successor and they elevated one of their own. Uh, Tacitus, an experienced statesman by all accounts, uh, serving in various high offices of the imperial government. And uh, he was like a Nerva type, you know, very old, but a very senior and respected statesman. And uh, it is most likely the case that he had no relation to the great historian Tacitus. Uh, even though he and others try to make it seem that way. So, he's probably not related. Um, but it would be interesting if he were. Taken by surprise with the elevation, Tacitus gave a fine speech, granting the senators lots of power to appease their egos. Quite fitting, as he would be the last emperor they ever elected into power. Opia and her daughter then voluntarily abdicated and vanished from the history books. Yes, so when Tacitus came to power, he restored much of the old senatorial privileges and powers that they had during their late and, well, really the whole of the Republican era. Um, though this would be uh, short-lived, <laughs> these reforms. Uh, but Tacitus... Uh, was still, uh, you know, a capable statesman, and, and by all counts, he was uh, a decent uh, general, uh, but he didn't uh, last too long, so we can't really make a fair assessment of his reign. Tacitus then traveled to Moesia to meet the legions, saw that the legionaries were still torturing Aurelian's assassins and decided to just ease tensions and order their executions. Meanwhile, word of Aurelian's death reached the germs. Who used this chance to remind everyone of course that the they did. of the third century was still ongoing. Tacitus then sent his half brother and Praetorian prefect, Florianus, to go clean up the Danube from 99% of the germs. And to help him rule, Tacitus appointed the legate Probus as governor of the eastern provinces. For after a lifetime of war in the service of Aurelian, including retaking Egypt from Zenobia, Probus had become among the best generals of the time. Yes, uh, Probus is one of those characters that we'd really like to know more about. Unfortunately, again, the sources are extant when it comes to this era, and so we know very... I wouldn't say we know very little, but we would like to know a lot more. Because Probus, by all accounts, was the most capable general uh, after Aurelian's death, and he should be up there among the top generals of Roman history. Uh, if our sources are correct and what little information we have on him, it all suggests that he was one of them. So, um, 
spoiler alert, he's gonna become an emperor and pretty good one too. While touring the east, Tacitus heard that the breach of the Lime Germanicus allowed the Germans to invade Gaul again. Alemanni, Franks, Goths, Vandals, Burgundians, every viral species. But oh yes, the uh, barbarian invasions never end, do they? And unfortunately for the Romans, uh, this would get worse with time. But uh, right now, they still have the strength to push them out at least. Um, and, uh, well, the thing, this situation is going to stabilize soon enough. Before he could respond, he caught a very weird illness. It basically drove him mad, making him name all 12 months of the year in his honor, and then dying right after. Deja vu. And as the the syndrome. And having the most legions at hand, Florian has usurped power and acclaimed himself emperor. The as they do. But he didn't really have the legions. In the hearts of every veteran, only those among Aurelian's officer corps deserved to wear the purple. And among those, Probus currently held the highest rank, so it was him they recognized as Augustus. Florianus didn't relent though, and marched east to face Probus, which proves to be his undoing. Probus' reputation was that of a veteran that won victories in every corner of the empire, and when he faced him in Cilicia, he used his experience to lock Florianus' bigger army at the hot climate of the Sicilian gates. With the legions being tortured by the harsh climate, they just killed the usurper Florianus and joined up with Probus, like they wanted to. And after being recognized by the Senate, Probus defended Moesia against another Gothic invasion, crushing them so hard that they begged for a peace treaty. He then marched to Gaul and began brutally slaughtering all Germanic invaders. As he fought, he pushed them back to the Rhine, recovering the lost forts of the border and killing as many barbarians as possible. By the end of the campaign, he spared the world of 400,000 germs and was acclaimed both Germanicus and Gothicus Maxim. So, uh, yeah, like I said previously, Probus was an extremely capable general, by all accounts. And he well deserved the cognomens Germanicus and Gothicus Maximus. And, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that his reign was cut short, like every other great emperor of this era. Sadly, the border regions of the Rhine had been severely depopulated by the constant barbarian onslaught. So Probus figured on settling some germs as civilians in the most affected areas, hoping they would integrate with the local populace. Meanwhile, Diocles was serving in Gaul as well, alongside his fellow officer, Galerius. And seeing him rising through the ranks, he was approached by a soothsayer that proclaimed Diocles would attain great power by slaying a boar. And prophecies never lie, they are just... severed. Yeah, it's one of those apocryphal stories uh, that keeps popping up in, especially in Roman history, but throughout general history. All of these convenient prophecies that later turn out to be true. Uh, can you imagine that? I wonder who, who made sure this sort of history was spread. As a diligent soldier, Probus allowed no idleness among his troops. If there were no barbarians to kill, then there were swamps to drain and farms to tend to. He extended that philosophy to the Praetorian Guard, and to keep their treacherous tendencies in check, he appointed a man he highly trusted, Carus, as his Praetorian Prefect. Probus then rode on, continuing to defend against barbarians from Raetia to the Nile, suppressing revolts from Hispania to Britannia, and ordering the ruins of the empire to be slowly rebuilt. And after celebrating a triumph, he sought to revive Aurelian's campaign against Rome's enemies, starting, as he did, against the Sassanids. And with the number of Rome's enemies already decreasing a lot, Probus expressed joy that perhaps one day Rome won't even need soldiers anymore. And yeah. expressing the Praetorians heard loud and clear. Already pissed at being forced to perform civic duty for once, and with the prospect of a peaceful future making their jobs obsolete, the Praetorian Guard then had Probus murdered. Yes, so the army and especially the Praetorian Guard were quite resentful that Probus was using them to do what they considered menial tasks, like clearing swamps and whatnot. Um, these menial tasks, they were very important and they were good for the Empire and its citizens, but it was apparently beneath their dignity, and as such, being unhappy with Probus' uh, usage of their manpower, they had him killed. And uh, it's a repeating story at this point in history. It's uh, quite sad that someone, again, of Aurelians and Probus, uh, 
capability and status was murdered by these army officers again. Even though he was about to give them the campaign they wanted. <laughs> so, very soon. They then claimed their prefect Carus as their emperor, yet another unwilling Augustus to add to the pile. And after having all of Probus' assassins executed and being too old to rule effectively, Carus elevated both of his sons, Carinus and Lumerian, as Caesars, despite the weakness of the latter and debauchery of the former. In his reign, he would appoint Diocles as his cavalry commander and consul to boot, serving together with a competent soldier, Maximian, who was also a really dumb politician, later sending Constantius to govern Dalmatia, the homeland of Diocles. Picking up where Probus left off, Carus marched east with Numerian to face off the Sassanids, while leaving the west at the hands of Carinus. And as he cleaned up phrase from some barbarian invaders in the Sassanid Empire, Shapur's banishment made some weaker demons take his place, and when Carus invaded, he was met with little resistance, allowing him to take all of Mesopotamia, sack Tassiphon, and cross the Tigris River. Yeah, so while the Sassanids would become a more formidable enemy than the Parthians ever were, that doesn't mean the Sassanid didn't have weak rulers too. And uh, many a Roman emperor at this time <laughs> managed to exploit the internal divisions of the Sassanids and various weak king of kings and to invade Mesopotamia and sack Tessiphon. And if you sack Tessiphon, you're a good Roman emperor in my book. Not every rem uh, emperor could do that. And it was a luxury um, in the later centuries. While in Rome, Carinus proved again that some apples can fall really fucking far from the tree. The minute he became emperor, he started punishing everyone he'd envied or didn't like, completely trashed the imperial palace and married and divorced nine different women, none of them his actual wife. Yeah, so, um, again, we have a problem with the sources here. It's very possible that uh, Diocletian will... Uh, or has rewritten uh, history here. Um, Diocletian have left behind uh, a lot of sources that are clearly biased in his favor and uh, besmirches his uh, incompetent uh, predecessors and so on. So, you know, who knows the truth about this? But the fact is, Numerian wasn't, uh, by all accounts, not a good co-emperor. Once Carus heard of his son's depravities, he declared his intent to substitute him with one of his best legates, Constantius Chlorus, yet another one of our Now there's a good man. Dragon's veterans. Having personally helped him crush the Palmarine Empire, Constantius was well known for both his talent and loyalty. Acclaimed as Persicus Maximus, Carus prepared to venture even further than even Trajan did, and it was then that he was struck by lightning and died. For a competent emperor to incur divine wrath confused a lot of people. Yeah, here again, um, I mean, he could have been hit by lightning. It has been known to happen to people, even though the the odds are pretty bad. Um, but it could also be an excuse or something written in the sources to conceal an assassination or something of the like. We don't know, but it just seems just a bit too convenient that he just up and died by a lightning bolt of all things, but hey, maybe he just had bad luck. But not Commander Diocles, who assured this must have been part of some grander divine plan. Convinced this was a sign to return home, Diocles convinced Numerian, guided by his Praetorian Prefect, to order them back to the Empire. Oh, was it Carinus who had the nine wives? I uh, get these two mixed up. They're inconsequential emperors. I don't keep the details on them. As they marched west, April told the legionnaires the emperor had suffered from an eye disease and had to be concealed from the light. So they kept on going, with April relaying ever more absurd orders in the emperor's name, while a foul stench arose, all making Diocles grow ever more suspicious. Breaking in to check on the Marian, he found the emperor's corpse rotting in a pool of his own blood, betrayed by the Praetorian guard, who could have guessed. Numerian's generals then had April seized, meeting together in Nicomedia. Yes, so apparently they were on the road back home and the Emperor was in a carriage uh, for some reason. And after a few days, 
we start to smell them. So after a few days, there was this uh, apparently odd stench coming from the Emperor's carriage. Turns out he's been dead for a few days. And uh, yeah, with that, there was going to be some claimants to the Imperial throne. And Diocletian will seize this opportunity to have himself proclaimed Augustus. To discuss what to do next. And after realizing Carinus was now the sole emperor, the generals agreed that the greatest among them, Diocles, should rise to confront him. The generals and legions then gathered on a hill outside Nicomedia and proclaimed Diocles as Augustus. He accepted, drawing his sword towards the sun, renaming himself as Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletianus and executing Aper for all to see. Yeah, so this was pretty common. Um, the reason he changed from uh, Diocles to Diocletian or Diocletianus um, was it sounded more Latin, sounded more regal, and it was not at all unusual for emperors to choose a regnal name which included the name of past emperors and that is uh, that was a way for them to establish some kind of link to past emperors so aurelian and valerian are the ones being uh, referenced here and they were both very competent emperors uh, indeed so you know fine imperial regnal name Aper, by the way, is Latin for boar, doja. Seeking to free the empire from the tyranny of Carinus, Diocletian marched west, and Carinus in turn marched east. Just then another usurper rose up in Pannonia, and man, what's with that fucking place and traitors? Well, anyway. Pannonia and Illyria are almost famous for the amount of rebellions uh, that spawn from there. I don't know, it's something about that area that... Uh, Tends to breed dissent and rebels. Before Carinus' overwhelming numbers faced off with Diocletian in Illyria, Constantius joined up with his brother in arms, helping him survive the initial battles. Carinus, however, enjoyed the opposite situation, and legion after legion refused to fight for him, defecting to Diocletian's banner. And as he raged on, he was suddenly backstabbed by his Praetorian prefect. Well, yeah, um, Diocletian's reputation is. Uh, much better as a general and it was not at all uncommon for legions to defect their emperor or commander whatever was the case if the odds were stacked against them and once you've been abandoned by your army the praetorians will stab you in the back that's just how it goes one of the many officers he had cut emerging victorious as the sole ruler of the empire, and then immediately crushing the last barbarian horde still reigning the empire, Diocletian concluded Aurelian's legacy, officially putting an end to the crisis of the 3rd century. That didn't mean peace was assured, far from it. In fact, Diocletian's unending obsession throughout his reign would be to ensure nothing like the crisis ever happened again. The decades of torment had shaped Diocletian into a brilliant yet cynical mind. And after seeing how irrelevant and unhelpful the Senate was during it all, he grew to despise it even more than Domitian, ignoring it completely. Yes, so Diocletian is uh, one of those really transformational emperors who both were extremely able on the battlefield and politically, administratively. Uh, it can be argued that Diocletian is perhaps the most impactful uh, Roman, Empire, uh, Roman emperor in terms of the long uh, legacy he left even after his reign was over. Uh, he's right up there with Augustus when it comes to really transforming the foundation of what we know as the Roman Empire. And uh, Diocletian would really um, put in some work to make sure that the crisis of the 3rd century would not just repeat itself when he was gone. The age of Augustus' principate has ended. No longer would power be derived from the corrupted institutions of the Republic. Rome needed something more. Thus, the emperor's authority now derived from nothing else than divine right. 
The age of the dominant had dawned, with Diocletian not as your princeps, your first citizen, but as Dominus, your lord and master. So Diocletian rightly recognized that the empire, what the empire really needed right now was a strong, central, authoritative figure. And the Principit was not cutting it anymore. Um, the Augustan illusion that the emperors were merely the first citizen, the first senator, the first among equals, was truly uh, overplayed at this point and it was not really working anymore and so Diocletian would begin to really transform what it meant to be a Roman Emperor and uh, he proceeded to establish what we historians call the Dominate which really means the period where the emperor transformed into a really authoritarian figure. And what happened is that uh, the emperor uh, now started to seclude himself. Uh, he would not be seen in public uh, very often anymore. He would be locked behind the, the imperial palace, behind various guards and courtiers and more guards and courtiers. And he started dressing in the imperial purple. He wore a diadem. And he really adopted this uh, royal uh, sort of figure that would have been unacceptable to the Romans of old. Uh, but at this point, you know, it's been overplayed for uh, centuries, I would argue, at this point. Uh, and so, you know... His goal here was to make the Emperor almost a semi-divine figure. A mythological aspect would surround them. There would be a cloak of mystery shrouding these the Roman Emperors, which gave them which really changed the psychology of his subjects. And no longer could you see the emperor walking on the streets, hearing the petty concerns of the citizens and uh, hanging out with the senators. No, he was establishing that he was the sole authoritative figure in the empire. His word was law. His word is the word of God himself. And so, um, this is uh, something we will see later down the line in the medieval monarchies and absolutist monarchies of Europe. But this is really where it started. And uh, this is perhaps the most lasting legacy of Diocletian, the transformation of the role of emperor. And this would be retained throughout uh, the Western and Eastern Roman empires. And to prevent the past from repeating itself, Diocletian concluded a single emperor could hardly rule effectively if the empire faced multiple threats at the same time. Diocletian knew only truly great men could rule over the whole Roman Empire. So to build a system where great men weren't needed, he chose to elevate his friend Maximian as Caesar, assuming the title of Jovius, another name for Jupiter, and Maximian taking the title of Herculius, the son of Jupiter. And here we go again. Uh, Diocletian is tying his royal authority to Jupiter himself. He is the son of Jupiter. He's the son of a god. And this is something Augustus did do. Uh, he called himself Divi Filius, the son of a god, because he had Julius Caesar deified uh, after his death. And uh, this was really to grant him this uh, lineage connection to the gods that Diocletian's word was the word of God so um, or Jupiter he is a god but you get my point and uh, yeah this is what I mean and this is all about changing the psychology of his subjects and how people look at the emperor 
with two emperors to help each other, and their authority now emanating from divine right, Diocletian severely discouraged future usurpers from rising up as they used to. And with his rule consolidating, Diocletian's attention shifted to the Praetorian Guard. Oh, the Praetorian Guard. <laughs> oh, he the Praetorians. The fury of a thousand souls, but instead of killing them all, Diocletian felt more appropriate to humiliate them instead. All Praetorians were then kicked out of the Imperial Palace, cut down in both number and wealth, and sent to guard an irrelevant shithole of a fort in Rome, given no task but to see if at how irrelevant they now were. Indeed, their treachery now only reached as far as the Milvian Bridge did, right beside the entrance to Remember this location, it's gonna be important. Rome. And for those of you who have kept this place in mind, keep keeping it. The discouragement- Yes, uh, so I don't wanna get in ahead of myself here. But uh, Diocletian's reform is going to severely strengthen um, central authority of the emperor and the empire itself. And so, this is going to mean, among other things, that the importance of Rome as a political center is going to basically vanish during the reign of Diocletian. Rome will remain an still an important cultural an historical heart of the empire, but it will no longer be the heart of administration, and it will no longer be where the emperor um, conducts business from. Instead, the power is going to be, that political power, administrative power, is going to be transferred to new capitals, closer to the frontiers, where the emperors are most busy these days, uh, in Diocletian's case, he set up base at Mediolanum. Today, it's called Milan. Maybe you heard of it. And uh, there's going to be a capital at Ravenna. And and there's going to be a capital in Nicomedia. That's where he set up shop as uh, he took responsibility for the eastern half of the empire. And we let, we, uh, let uh, his uh, co-emperor, uh, his Caesar, have the western empire. So, you know... Um, that's just how it is, and because of that, and uh, because the Praetorians are usually stationed outside of Rome, that means they will no longer have much of any sway in political affairs, because they're so far away from where the political action is. They are not even close to the Emperor at this point, and they are a glorified city guard for the city of Rome. But however, it didn't include barbarians, forcing him to go crush some Sarmatians, and later sending Maximian to Milan, where he was to rule the West and hunt down some bandits raiding Central Gaul. Regarding the Sassanids, Diocletian had the weak demon king bow to his whim, making him return Armenia and give up more of Mesopotamia. And as he did, the Germans in the Rhine started naval expeditions of their own, ransacking the Gallic coast, all while the Alemanni and Burgundians redestroyed the Lyme Germanicus. So to deal with the pirates, Maximian sent his best naval officer, Carausius, while he fought the germs on the land. Unfortunately, Carausius cared for nothing but gold. Not only taking the wealth the Franks stole for himself, but outright letting the germs pass by and second oh boy. Pirates, just so he could intercept them and take the raided wealth for himself. Horrified by these news, Maximian demanded Carausu should come back to him and answer for his crimes, which of course he refused, stealing the Imperial fleet for himself, using the wealth to bribe the Britons to support him, allying with the Franks, helping them take over the Gallic coast and proclaiming himself Augustus of his new Britannic Empire. Yes, uh, we are starting to see a theme of entire provinces of the Empire just breaking away non-stop and this is like the third iteration right we had the gallic and the palmarine empires now we had the britannic empire now fortunately for everyone involved uh, the britannic empire is not gonna be lasting a very long time unlike uh, the other two i just mentioned and uh, diocletian and friends will sort this out shortly yeah, a really dumb politician indeed and no one was more pissed about this than Diocletian. The legitimacy of the diarchy at stake, Diocletian refused Carausus's demands to be legitimized, elevating Maximian as an Augustus to save his reputation, then coordinating with him to launch a counter-invasion, brutally ravaging Carausus's germ allies. Having helped him do so, Diocletian returned east again, got flanked by rude Sarmatians again, and crushed them again. 
Maximian then built his own fleet, completely botched the invasion and then blamed everything on the weather. Hearing the news, the Euclidean Well, to be fair, the weather in the English Channel is notoriously treacherous to navigate. Julius Caesar himself had problems with that, so I don't particularly blame him for that. Um, it's just how it is. Romans and um, the water were like, uh, they were not friends. Let's just say that. Side ...and marched west again, meeting with his co-emperor in Mediolanum, throwing a party to save Maximian's reputation and making sure to humiliate the senate some more. But the diarchy wasn't working as it should. If one of the emperors needed help from the other, it left their part of the empire leaderless. And so, Diocletian doubled down on his new system, transforming the diarchy... Now, um, Diocletian is the first emperor to institute the administrative um, division of the Roman Empire into an east and west um, section. And this would become a permanent division, de facto permanent division, uh, later down the line. Uh, but for now, uh, this was purely a administrative thing, you know, to uh, have an emperor on each half of the empire would allow uh, the empire to respond more effectively to crises that emerged in the respective halves. Uh, but, like I just said here, Dovati, Diocletian decided to double down, and he would have uh, appointed two more junior emperors, two Caesars, and as such, the empire was split into a quarter. So, there would be four administrative divisions, a rule of four, a tetrarchy into the Tetrarchy, with the theme of four emperors, one empire. And he just had the right man in mind, his two veteran friends, Constantius and Galerius. The latter was then elevated as Caesar of the East by Diocletian, arranged to marry his daughter, and the former as Caesar of the West by Maximian, who had already divorced his wife and married Maximian's daughter. So here's Diocletian's Tetrarchy, one empire, ruled by two senior Augusti, with two junior Caesars to serve as heirs and rule the shit provinces. Each had their own capital, borders didn't mean shit really, they pretty much just did whatever Diocletian told them to, and once the Augusti- And if you look at where the capitals of the respective uh, divisional uh, divisions of the empire are, you can see what I mean. All of the capitals are located fairly close to the frontier, Nicomedia is not really close to the borders with the Sassanids, but all other capitals are, and it's not a coincidence. Uh, this was so that each emperor could be ready to face and fend off any barbarian invasion at any time. As Tai died, the Caesars would take over their place, and two new Caesars would be chosen. Do notice the senators completely powerless over here, where they belong. Since they were all one big family now, Diocletian hosted both of Constantius's and Maximian's sons in his court, among them an ambitious little cunt, Maxentius. He then sent Galerius to go crush a revolt in the Nile, and then Constantius to go put down Carausus' revolt. Being granted the hardest task in the empire, and seeing the port of Bononia was the main base of Carausus' fleet, Constantius first cleared the Gallic coast of the Franks, then laid siege to Bononia, making his legions build a dam over the port, denying it any relief, and forcing them to surrender. With his Britonic empire now crumbling, Carausus was then murdered by his Praetorian prefect, Alectus. <laughs> nah, just kidding, he was his finance minister of the people, <laughs> but who cares. Constantius then built a fleet, invaded, and had Alactus killed as well. With their partners in crime now dead, the Franks were let off the leash and started slaughtering all innocent civilians around them. As they marched south to sack Londinium, Constantius halted them, completely exterminating every last Frank, and when he turned to start what was gonna be a brutal siege for Londinium, the local Brits received him as their hero, acclaiming him as the restorer of eternal light. Redditor Lucius Eterna. <laughs> yeah, so that that title is uh, very fancy and sounds pretty good, but I don't know if you know saving Londinium is uh, or bringing Londinium back into the fold of the empire is really worth it. I mean, that title seems uh, something that should be reserved for 
Uh, some greater deeds, perhaps. Ride to Constantius, then returned to Truia in the Rhine. While his Augustus Maximian was fighting Frankish pirates that had gotten all the way to Numidia, germs in North Africa. Imagine that. Unfortunately, this is not the last we will hear about barbarians in North Africa. Oh boy. I don't want to get into it here, it's just depressing. And after dealing with some Berber barbarians in the mountains, we get to what most defined Diocletian's reign. Reforms, reforms, and a fuckload of reforms. Starting off, not only did Diocletian more than double the number of imperial provinces. Yes. Uh, what defines Diocletian's rule more than anything else is reforms. He loved reforms. And uh, they were extremely necessary too. Uh, because uh, at this point um, in Roman history, local government, provincial government, it had all ceased to exist. The administration of justice, the collecting of taxes, and the maintenance of infrastructure had completely gone away. None of that was being conducted anymore. Uh, there was effectively no government uh, besides the army out in the provinces. And it was Diocletian's great ambition to restore that. And to begin with, he did a administrative reform in which the number of provinces was doubled from about 50 to 100. And there are several advantages with this. Now, that meant that each provincial governor had a more manageable workload um, because, say, administration of justice. Um, the governors, the provincial governors, were complaining about the caseload being too much, and therefore they skipped it altogether, uh, enforcing justice. But now that the provinces were smaller, there was a more reasonable caseload for the provincial magistrates to deal with. And, uh, you know, this has several other advantages. Um, for example, since the provinces are now smaller, that meant each provincial governor had effectively less power uh, and could not use the province's resources to stage a rebellion, which had been far easier with the bigger provinces. And there are other uh, advantages which I could get into, but we'll be here all day. So I'm just gonna sell for that. But his new system of diocese would be stolen by the Christians of all people. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's ironic. Diocletian established the, the diocese. He also established the position of ducks and uh, vicars. And if you recognize these terms, you should. It's because the Catholic Church has co-opted most of them and they still form the basis of the administrative division of the Catholic Church. And considering that Diocletian is the greatest persecutor of Christian in Roman history, there is uh, some bittersweet irony there. The governor of each diocese not only now ruled over less resources, but the soldiers in his lands were now led by another dude, the ducks. In fact, Diocletian made it so bureaucratic and military careers were permanently distinguished from each other. Now, if you know anything about Rome, you know that a political career in Rome is a military career. The two are indistinguishable, or at least was until the, up until this moment. Uh, if you made it, wanted to make a career in the Republic, you had to accomplish some great military deeds, or at least be a military leader, or served in the military at some point. And um, the greatest uh, politicians of the Republic were great generals. Julius Caesar, Fabius Maximus, so on and so forth. Pompey Magnus. And uh, this continued on in the Empire too. Even though the Emperor held the real authority, if men wanted to make a career, you'd have to go through the military. And if you had success in the military, it often led to political benefits. Many an Emperor uh, was a soldier from the beginning, 
and uh, now they have all this political power. But this was really a radical uh, reform by Diocletian, and a very necessary one, too, I would argue. Because the fact is, when you've done this division, now it is not possible for the ducks, who is commanding the military forces, to use a province resources uh, to stage a rebellion. Because those were now in the hand of a bureaucrat, a local magistrate, a provincial magistrate, uh, depending on the level of administration here. And uh, so this was very good for maintaining order in the provinces, ensuring nobody challenged Diocletian's rules, finally put some order back in things. And speaking of the legions, Diocletian also got rid of the old cohort system as a whole, basing much of his thinking from what emperors like Gallienus had to endure. The barbarian invasions were now too big for 5,000 man strong legions sparsely placed to deal with. So he did two things. One, he hugely increased the size of the army from 390,000 men to 580,000 men, most of them stationed in the east. The navy got a bump as well. And two, the Roman army now displayed two main units, the Limitani Ripensis, plebs that guarded the frontiers part-time, and the new legion, the Comitatensis, making up nimbler units of 1,000 men each and supported with a lot of cavalry. The legions were now far more mobile and practical, so much so Diocletian built some 20 new legions, Yes, uh, Diocletian also made some very important military reforms and he established the Limitani system where you would have these part-time, um, not very well equipped, not very well drilled soldiers guarding the frontiers. And their job was to fight off petty raiding parties and delay the bigger invasions until the main army could arrive. The Limitani system would be retained for many, many centuries, uh, even after the Western Roman Empire has collapsed. And he also established the Comitatensis. Now the legions were smaller, or the units within the legion were smaller. And that meant they were more flexible uh, to move around and uh, so forth. And they had a stronger cavalry contingent. And... If you know anything about Roman military history, you know that cavalry has traditionally been the neglected arm of the Roman military, but the experience of Gallienus and Aurelian has taught Diocletian that cavalry is going to be absolutely essential if Rome is ever going to have a chance to defend itself. Uh, cavalry is just stronger <laughs> against uh, these petty barbarian tribes, but also since they're on horseback, they can move around more quickly, and if need be, they can all combine into one giant cavalry force that roamed uh, the borders uh, like Gallienus did. So uh, these were also very important reforms that would really stick, and the importance of cavalry would only increase as the centuries goes on, and it's going to become the absolutely most critical part of the Roman army going forward. And inspired by Aurelian's walls, every major city across the empire began building walls of their own. Yes, Emperor Aurelian had constructed the Aurelian walls around Rome. And we know that Rome is a notoriously difficult city to defend. And with the advent of more and more aggressive and large-scale barbarian invasions, Diocletian correctly recognize the need for every major city, or every city period, to have some sort of uh, fortification. And obviously the bigger and richer cities would have more extensive fortifications. But these were really needed to protect major urban population centers. Because uh, even with the Lamitani, it would still take some time for the Roman main armies to arrive to put an end to the barbarian threats. And such, uh, this was a very prudent uh, move by Diocletian. In this new system, with the Limitani defending the borders, small invaders were easily repelled, and large invasions were both spotted and relayed to other troops. Once the big barbarian hordes broke through, they would be unable to break through the nearest city walls, lacking siege weapons and all. Getting harassed by local forces until the nearest emperor had time to muster the legions and kick the barbarians back to their mud hut. Yes, and if we have 
four emperors covering each frontier, the response time is going to be drastically lower. And uh, this really was quite an ingenious system. It is a defense in depth system where previously Rome had refused to accept the notion that their borders could be violated by barbarians. Well, now they sort of gave up on that and recognized that, yeah, we're going to get raided and they're going to penetrate our waters. And we might as well just recognize reality here and think differently. And they started to think about defense in depth. And of course, with the new city walls, like he said, these barbarian tribes have no experience in siege warfare. Now that would change eventually, uh, but uh, that is not the case right now. And it would not be the case for quite a while. So, really, this is a brilliantly set up system, but there are some flaws in it, of course, and we'll get to that. Defense in death, we now call it. A common strategy for large empires. And this was all terribly expensive as well. So to collect the taxes you pay for it all, Diocletian sent his agents to perform the first empire-wide census in history, cataloging every last property, land, plab and patrician there was, figuring out how much each citizen could provide. Yes. Now, Diocletian uh, massively expanded the size of the Roman bureaucracy. In fact, he created the biggest Roman uh, bureaucracy seen up until this point. Uh, he went from 15 to 30,000 um, uh, bureaucrats, basically. And he hired them mostly from the noble equestrian class, that's the minor nobility, that's below the senatorial ranks. And he completely cut out the Senate from any part of government affairs. Now, ever since the Principate, the, the Roman emperors have showed some level of deference to the Senate and still gave them plum cool jobs as provincial governors and, and they could govern the senatorial provinces and and, you know, they could still earn political office and have some influence here and there. You know, not major influence, but still, they had some, they had their glory and honor still, you know, attached to the office of uh, senator. No longer. Um, Diocletian was going to rely on professionals and not corrupt senators to do his governing. They were kind of miffed about this, but what could they do at this point? Sadly. And uh, also, he mentioned here. Um, he conducted the first empire-wide census. And when he said he, they catalogued everything, I mean everything. Every man, woman, child, slave, uh, every damn resource uh, you had. And there's a good reason for that, because Diocletian is struggling with inflation. The Denari by that point was utterly worthless, so Diocletian issued new coins, among them a new gold coin, the Solidus, THE gold coin, the one everyone and their peasant mother would copy for millennia. It would take a while until the monetary reforms took effect. Yes, um, at this point, due to the fact that uh, many an emperor before Diocletian, especially during the crisis of the 3rd century, had minted so many coins, especially to pay for the army. Uh, the fact is, inflation is running rampant in the empire at this point, and Diocletian is trying to address this with the coinage reform. Now, there would now be two copper coins, one mixed copper-silver coin, one silver coin, and one gold coin, a gold solidus, which would remain the empire's main currency for many centuries to come even into the later Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, but the problem with the coinage reform here is that there are so many damn bad coins in circulation. Remember, these are not just any coins, they are devalued coins, they're worthless coins. And unfortunately for Diocletian and every other Roman Emperor, they didn't really understand modern monetary policy. Uh, now, they knew that minting many devalued coins was not good for the economy, but they didn't really know what to do about it once they did it. And, you know, even if they knew, they did it anyways, because they had to for various reasons. And uh, unfortunately, Diocletian's new coinage would prove very ineffective in combating inflation. 
because uh, he had not done enough uh, recall of the bad coins. Now, he ordered some recall of the coins, but what he really needed to do is bring in all of these terrible bad coins that had been minted and was in circulation and, you know, put them out of business. Uh, and only then could his new coins have an effect in dampening inflation and putting the economy back on track. And fighting inflation would become Diocletian's uh, greatest uh, goal, almost, and it's the one he failed at, unfortunately. So Diocletian had his new army of bureaucrats to come up with an equivalent chart of items to temporarily replace currency. When the tax collectors came, the plebs were allowed to pay with anything. Foods, goods, their mother, whatever they had. And yes, so... And what will Diocletian do when the currency is basically worthless and the inflation is rampant? Oh, well, he tried to just go around currency altogether. And so he came up with a really ingenious system, really, whereby you could... Uh, uh, yeah, you were given a theoretical tax unit you would have to pay. Um, let's say you had to pay 75 tax units, or whatever you want to call them. And uh, then they made a list of goods and services in the empire, and what it would be theoretically worth, how many tax units they would be worth. And uh, so you could, say, have if you had a, have to pay 75 tax units, then you could maybe... You, maybe you could provide bushels for the army, swords, uh, transport, uh, shoes, armor, whatever, anything. And until you met your tax unit quota. And so you basically had a system where you traded goods and services. Instead, you paid with goods and services instead of currency because it was worthless. So... This is how he was able to, quote-unquote, fund the expanded bureaucracy and the army, especially the army. And uh, so the soldiers, you know, they still got paid with currency, but it wasn't worth anything. So th what they really got paid in was what uh, the emperor brought in in forms of goods. Yeah, so it's really... It worked, actually, uh, but, oh, you know, you can't go around the problem with currency entirely. But it was a stopgap measure that proved to be effective. Part and parcel of Diocletian's enlightened autocracy, he standardized Rome's taxation system on all provinces, meaning that Italy, long exempt from taxes, now paid as much as Illyrian provincials and the like did. Only Rome remained safe from this, as despite of the Senate, Diocletian still respected the eternal sea. So Diocletian, um, in an effort to uh, keep this expanded army and bureaucracy afloat, like to pay for it and all that, uh, he really needed to maximize uh, the resources he could extract from the empire. And uh, what he did was to eliminate the special privileges that was held by Italy and also Egypt, which had very special deals worked out with the imperial government regarding taxation. And uh, Diocletian did away with all of these special privileges in order to make all provinces equal in the eye of the both law and taxation. And only Rome, the eternal city itself, was uh, exempted from these changes because Rome is a very special city, and it's really only for sentimental reasons it was excluded from this. And uh, this is all an effort, uh, all part of Diocletian's greater effort to rationalize the Roman uh, Empire, basically. He tried to make everything more logical, more rational, more hierarchical and basically build an extremely centralized state. Such centralization would not be seen until the founding of the modern nation-states in the 
maybe 19th century and um, it's really quite something. I could talk for days about this as you, I'm sure you know this, but uh, yeah, Diocletian is a, this is what I mean about Diocletian being a transformative emperor. But as you likely gathered, he didn't care for plebs at all. In fact, in order to further stabilize the empire, Diocletian transformed the plebs into proto-peasants, serfs, if you will. They were now tied to their land, and get this, permanently chained to hereditary professions. The plebs were now to inherit their father's profession, and never be allowed to quit. A reform done so that the empire would never run short of crucial professions. Yes, uh, this was uh, perhaps one of Diocletian's most controversial reforms. And when he did this, it made a lot of sense. It did. Um, Diocletian feared that certain professions, he feared that social mobility would make it so that certain professions and certain goods would become unavailable to the Roman state and the army. And so, in order to ensure that the, the empire wouldn't run out of uh, mule drivers, for example, to take one, and, and any other goods and services, he, made, um, he started to take over all of the uh, trade guilds that operated within the empire. And he basically came in there and uh, you know, took control directly of these uh, various guilds. And once they were in the imperial sphere of influence, they couldn't leave. So um, this was a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight. But eventually, he had taken over all the trade guilds of the empire. And this is an ensured that there was... This established some sort of proto-feudalism or, you know, basically serfdom. And, and this is the model which is used for little medieval serfdom and medieval feudalism. And, uh, of course, that is a very dubious legacy indeed. Uh, but at the time it made sense to do this. Long term, though, it proved to be quite damaging uh, to the Roman economy. Because social mo mobility was a big part of the Roman economy. So, you know, um, it is what it is. Um, but... Like I said, it made sense back then. While these reforms tackled pretty much all problems inherent of the 3rd century, inflation still ran rampant, and man, did that ever trigger Diocletian. Such inflation forced his own soldiers to blow their entire savings just to live another day, and every time he was reminded of this injustice, it enraged him deeply. Yeah, I, I heard stories, I'm not sure if the veracity of these, but uh, it's probably true uh, that soldiers, you know, pay the year's wages just to get a shirt. And that's how bad uh, inflation was at this point. And Diocletian resorted to some rather extreme and ineffective measures. And who did he blame? None other than the merchants. None of them Jewish, though. Hadrian really didn't mess around. And so to fight this injustice, Diocletian wrote a fucking huge book, listing every single item that could be sold in the empire and establishing a maximum price it could be sold for. Yes, so this is perhaps one of uh, Diocletian's most interesting, failed, but, you know, famous, um, I wouldn't call it a reform, an edict. And so he issued this edict on maximum prices. It was, like he said, though, at the, the, it was a huge, huge list of goods and services. And all of them were capped to a maximum price. And this was Diocletian's way of getting to grips with inflation. But, like I just explained earlier, Romans didn't have a really good understanding of what, um, of modern economic theory. And uh, to us, this seems quite obvious. We know what happens when you institute broad um, price controls. We know they don't work, period. They just don't. And I don't want to get into all the economic reasons for why. That's not really relevant. Uh, all you need to know it didn't work. Diocletian even ordered um, the death penalty for anyone 
any merchant who sold above the prescribed maximum prices. But for us historians, it is a fascinating, well, relic, uh, because these were written on stone tablets and distributed throughout the empire. They were not written on paper. Um, but what we can glean from the parts that has survived of the edict is really uh, interesting for us because we get a sense of what sort of goods uh, the Romans had in circulation. We also get a sense of what professions so uh, were valued highly for example a mule driver i mentioned could make 25 denarii per day a stonemason could make 50 denarii a lawyer could make a thousand denarii and 250 denarii just for putting the case forward putting the pa paperwork uh, together so to speak so it really gives us a fascinating and unique uh, look at the internal life of the Roman economy and Roman life, really. We could see what different sorts of beer or uh, wine they had, rather. What sort of alcohol they had. So, you know, it's a um, really fascinating thing from our perspective. Uh, but for Diocletian's perspective, this was a huge failure. And everyone, you know, basically ignored it uh, the second it came out and it, it didn't work and the idea was quietly abandoned by Diocletian even himself you know he realized it, it was not working and so he didn't bother enforcing the death penalties and whatnot but no one paid heed to it even if the death penalty was at stake alas the world just wasn't ready for the full force of Diocletian's reforming genius and with say most of his reforms an astounding success Diocletian then went to fight against some other Sarmatian invasion. Yes. Even though there were some failures here, and even though the dubious things about the serfdom and all that, overall, Diocletian's reforms were long overdue, and they were mostly all successful in accomplishing what it needed to. And it was a wholesale renovation of the Roman imperial government, and it brought some much-needed stability and order in the chaos that had proceeded during the crisis of the 3rd century. And many of Diocletian's reforms forms the basis of later reforms uh, undertaken by, say, Emperor Justinian, for example. And so his legacy will continue to live on for many centuries. And, uh, yeah, that's it for his uh, administrative reforms. A very exciting topic, no doubt. I'm sure you all agree. <laughs> Again, this time in annihilating them so hard they pretty much stopped being an issue, calling himself Sarmaticus Maximus and building a series of forts to strengthen the Danube, with 15 legions worth of Limitani to guard it, which was much easier now without Dacia sticking out into the Carpathian Mountains. Yes, uh, so Emperor Aurelian um, rationalized the Roman borders. He evacuated the entire province of Dacia. He decided it was not worth keeping. It was undefendable and untenable. Uh, untenable sort of, um, how should we say it, um, protrusion of the borders, which just invited unnecessary conflict. And it was the right call to abandon it. All things. Meanwhile, Galerius was finishing crushing some wee wizards down the Nile, then went to Syria to face the renewed Sassanid threat, none other than Shapur's own son, Narse. Yes, the demon had laid eggs before his banishment, oh, of course. ensuring that his demonic <laughs> line would continue tormenting the world. And after usurping power from the weaker demons, Narse sought to restore his father's reign of terror, invading Armenia and then the Empire, and say it with me, slaughtering everyone on his path. Galerius then went to stop him at Carhe, but was completely overwhelmed by his endless hordes of evil. Barely managing to return safely from the battle, he was met by one furious Diocletian. For having disgraced Rome, Diocletian made his junior Caesar march a mile on foot throughout the desert sun. And having punished him so, he granted him some reinforcements to invade for Armenia this time, cucking Narses' cavalry in the mountains and beating him back. 
the Sassanids then camped away to recover, only to be caught by surprise by Galerius, forcing the demon to flee in panic, letting his soldiers, wife and harem of chaos to be captured alive by Galerius. The Romans then marched south and sacked Tassiphon for a... <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this was an unusual period in Roman history where Romans could basically walk in and sack Tassiphon, and uh, it would not be so easy. <laughs> Um, in the forthcoming centuries. What, the sixth time now? I lost count. Diocletian and Galerius then got Narsi to agree meeting up and discuss terms of peace. And get this, the Sassanids started out by demanding the Romans to be magnanimous in victory. Mold! Which just made Diocletian explode in anger. It was only after beating all of Narsi's minions to death with Valyrian skeleton that he was able to get his point across. The emperors then humiliated the Sassanids, retaking Armenia, expanding on Mesopotamia, and setting the Sassanid borders under permanent Roman occupation, ensuring peace for the next 30 years. Now, a 30 year peace between Rome and the Sassanid Empire is extremely unusual. That basically never happened. And um, yeah, it was, it was quite a state. <laughs> And to thank for their efforts, Egypt threw a big revolt. It's simple really. With Diocletian now cracking hard on the ancient Egyptian tradition of tax evasion, they revolted under a dude whose name I won't even bother you with. Now, what happened here is that the Egyptians, um, they had um, a tradition of, um, shall we say, tax evasion and during the Republic and the early Empire, this was fine. Uh, the later, the Republican governments and the early Imperial governments didn't really care as long as they got what they needed to fund the army and run the state. But at this point, Diocletian doesn't have that sort of luxury anymore, and he needs to squeeze... Um, as much resources as possible from every corner of the empire without killing them all completely, you know. Uh, he's not milking them dry, although later Roman emperors would, unfortunately. Uh, but I digress. And so um, they were not really fond of this uh, sort of uh, governing by Diocletian. Decided to make a big fuss of it. Not sure how they thought they were ever going to win against uh, a unified imperial army under Diocletian's command? I don't know, people are not rational beings, so, you know. After pacifying the countryside, Diocletian personally sieged Alexandria for nine gruesome months. After finally breaching in, Diocletian vowed to go full Caracalla on Alexandria until the blood reached his horse's knees, which was when his horse laid down on the pool of blood. As a pious man, Diocletian took the hand, and was merciful instead, ending with the citizens of Alexandria erecting a statue in Diocletian's horse's honor. The two emperors then went to Antioch to attend a spiritual sacrifice, but as the priests carved into the animals' entrails to read the god's words, they couldn't find anything. And when they were questioned what the problem was, he said that the Christians were fucking with his sacrifice. And yeah, they were. Furious at their impiety, and as Diocletian revived Decius's edict against Christians, he saw yet another foul cult arise. And apparently, um, uh, they did some sort of sacrifice, and uh, there were no signs, there were, the signs were messed with, and the Christians were blamed, uh, you know how this goes. And so the great purge can begin. Manichaeism. Seeing it for the demonic Persian chaos cult it was, Diocletian ordered all Manichaeists to be persecuted, destroying their temples, burning their religious texts, and executing every last one of them. And you know what? It worked. Manichaeism never grew too big and it was eventually eradicated from the empire, which gave both emperors some ideas. To decide what they should do, both emperors went to visit the Oracle of Apollo, one of the purest aspects of Sol Invictus but he was unable to help them, claiming that the impiety of the world had blinded him. For both emperors, enough was enough. For centuries the Christians shunned Rome's gods, defied its emperors, and set fire to everything else. Uh, yes, uh, so Diocletian was uh, a very conservative Roman emperor, and he had uh, held 
um, the traditional Roman views on religion. And he was very much worried about the Christians and um, the state of Christianity in the what, 4th century, the early 4th century, is really interesting to look at. The church at this point was very decentralized and they were very divided, uh, as Christians always are, on various topics. Uh, but there was also a problem of who really headed up this church. Um, the bishops of, say, Alexandria and Rome were among the most powerful um, religious leaders, and bishops were the de facto leaders here, uh, the various bishops of Christianity. There was no papacy really yet, although the bishop of Rome uh, would claim to be of higher status than the other ones, a claim that survives to this day. And uh, it's really interesting to you know, see how Christianity actually survived uh, three centuries because there were many times where they could have all splintered off and founded their own little sects and which would have been easy for Diocletian to wipe out uh, but this was not the case the church had survived somehow and survived somehow relatively intact no matter how internally divided they might be and they've sort of set up a a state structure is a bit of an exaggeration, but a somewhat organized structure. And it, uh, they, according in their eyes, it superseded the structure and authority of the empire of the state. And this was an unacceptable threat to Diocletian. And the uh, problem with Diocletian is the Christians at this point uh, represent maybe 10% of the population. That's uh, not the... Uh, it was the biggest uh, monotheistic religion by far. And uh, now it's not just, you know, uh, sects here and there, plebs here and there. There were actually, you know, powerful men who embraced Christianity. And, uh, well, now they're going to become a bit too big of a problem for Diocletian to deal with. He will try hard, though. And uh, so, you know... Um, we are coming up in a period of history where Christianity is about to become extremely important, especially with the rise of the next great emperor, Constantine the Great. And uh, I guess we'll talk about that in the next video. But that's just some you know, context for what we're talking about, what the situation of Christianity is at this point and its relation to the Roman Empire. They deserved nothing less than a great persecution. One, two, three, and go. Diocletian then wrote his edicts. By imperial decree, all churches, temples, texts, wealth, and rights were destroyed across the empire. Oh boy. Diocletian didn't comply. And as punishment, the Christians were fined, demoted, deposed, jailed, and exiled in the army and state. Now, bitchier than ever, true to Christ's cook tradition, they complained, lied, disobeyed, profaned, revolted, and hid no matter the cost. Despite Diocletian's mercy, the Christians tore the edicts from the streets and set fire to the imperial palace twice. The Christians had broken the law, ancient Roman virtues, and by then, Diocletian's patience. All lawbreakers were executed, and emperors ordered to kill, jail, flog, nail, cleave, flay, and torture every last Christian that disobeyed. Salt was rubbed in their wounds, forced to kneel to Rome's deities, and gouged, impaled, threatened, depraved, and injured in every way. Their leadership was devastated, and Diocletian made it law to kill, jail, flog, nail, cleave, hang, flay, torture, gouge, impale, threaten, deprave, bruise, stamp, injure, behead, multi to destroy, whip, tear, strike, cut, savage, wound, exile, sack, menace, and burn every single operating Christian. I don't know if I need to add anything about it. Um, the great persecution of the Christians were pretty much like this. It was pretty damn brutal. Lots of Christians uh, died along the way. And uh, boy, the amount of... <laughs> sheer cruelty on display here by the Romans is uh, staggering. Uh, they tried to give the Christians the Jewish treatment and even the Jews weren't treated this badly, uh, even at uh, its worst. So, <laughs> um, yeah, the 
Great persecution was ultimately a failure, however, and there were simply just too many Christians at this point to do anything about it. Now, you may ask, why didn't they, you know... What about the Jews? Well, Hadrian had taken care of the Jews, um, if you remember. But the Romans still had some modicum of respect for the Jewish people, because they were, you know, ancient, and uh, much more ancient than the Roman Empire itself, or even the Republic. And um, such, they had treated Jews differently. And they saw these Christians, though. They, they were like a new little sect going on here, just established some mere 300 years ago, and a nuisance uh, that they couldn't get rid of. So, uh, alas, uh, Diocletian's uh, policy here failed, and uh, he would not be able to stop the tide of Christianity. Not for lack of trying, though. Thousands of Christians lie dead, their leadership gutted, and churches destroyed. But in the end, it was too little, too late. The Christians continued proliferating, disobeying edicts, bribing off authorities, and overall negating all of the persecution's achievements. Diocletian and Galerius had killed many Christians, but at the end of the day, that's all they accomplished. Yeah, um, some sources, including Constantine himself, claimed that it was Galerius who was the main driver behind this. Uh, persecution, even though he is the one who will ultimately issue an edict of toleration in 311, uh, I believe. Um, and, you know, Diocletian came on along the ride. Um, who knows the truth of that, but uh, just some context I thought might be worth um, letting you guys know about. Constantius had predicted the persecution's failure, so he never invested too heavily on it. Maximian did though, but he was nevertheless unsuccessful as well. To calm down, Maximian celebrated their 20 years of co-rule by bringing Diocletian for his first ever official visit to the Eternal City. And in his honor, Maximian ordered- Think about that though. Uh, Diocletian has reigned for a very long time at this point. Much longer than anyone else ever did during the 3rd century. And uh, this is the first time, decades after he came to the power, that he made an official visit to Rome. And that speaks a lot about how politically irrelevant Rome is at this point. Built ...and Diocletian finished building the Baths of Diocletian, yet another massive bathing complex. It fit they like to build baths, if you haven't noticed. ...well with the massive palace he built back in Dalmatia too. More on that later. But try as he might to chill, Diocletian couldn't stop noticing how Rome had degenerated from the days of old. When he looked at the streets, all he saw were them filled with dirty plebs, adulterous whores, spreading Christ cookery, and corrupt Praetorians just looking for someone regal to stab. Enraged, Diocletian cut his visit short, refusing to attend his ninth consulship ceremony, already knowing the state the Senate would be in. Yeah, and... Uh... Traditionally, a Roman emperor would assume his consulship in the Eternal City, but even the Roman, even that they couldn't manage to do at this point, the Roman emperors could be bothered to go to Rome to do that. And the consulship was just a ceremonial thing anyways, so it wasn't really necessary. Even Emperor Aurelian didn't attend his uh, first consulship uh, ceremony or whatever. So, you know, eh. It is what it is, Rome is quietly, slowly but surely fading into the background. He then returned. Their glory days is definitely over. He returned east, helping Galerius to defend against a small Dacian invasion. But as he assisted him, Diocletian developed a crippling illness. He then returned to Nicomedia, opening a circus built in his honor and then secluding himself in his palace, growing ever weaker. When everyone grew to assume he had died, Diocletian reappeared, an unrecognizable shadow of his former self. Diocletian then gathered his men on the very same hill he was in two decades ago to proclaim his resignation, the first emperor to do so. Having and it, uh, it speaks volumes about the success of Diocletian's reign and his unchecked authority that he was able to step down on his own terms, voluntarily go into retirement and let the young guns take over from here. And uh, 
this is quite a remarkable feat, no doubt. But also, it signaled the end of the... How should I say it? The, not the restoration of the Empire, but... It signaled the end of internal peace, which had reigned during Diocletian's reign. There had been little to no usurpers at all, except that Egyptian affair. Uh, so, yeah. Unfortunately for Diocletian's tetrarchy, the system is about to unravel rather quickly without him being there. From two weeks to rule, he vowed to step out so that the younger Caesars could take over, convincing Maximian to do the same, though he really didn't want to. Yeah, uh, Maximian didn't want to retire, um, but you know, you don't say no to Diocletian, so he was kind of forced to accept it. He'll be back. Diocletian then elevated Galerius to the position of Augustus, as did Maximian to Constantius. And to fill up the two vacant Caesar slots, Maximinus and Constantius' sons were ignored. Maxentius was one of those little shits that could never be trusted with power, but it was Constantius' son that Diocletian was most concerned with. He was then left to Galerius to pick to the next Caesars, choosing an old military friend of his, Valerius Severus, yet another non-Severan, and also his own nephew, Daya. The tetrarchy now, formally, looked like this, but really was more like this right now. Here's the new Caesars not quite yet in power, there's Maximian and Maxentius left out, and here is Diocletian, spending his retirement in his Dalmatian homeland, cultivating the noblest of all vegetables. Now there are quite uh, some impressive intact remains of Diocletian's imperial palace on the Illyrian coastline still today. So, you know, if you're having Croatia, I believe it is now, um, you know, Check it out. <laughs> Cabbages. And in the West, Constantius ruled on. Ah, yeah, it, it's the famous story about um, Diocletian returning home, becoming a cabbage farmer. And uh, it's a very similar uh, story to, you know, Cincinnatus, how he went back to his farm after the Republic called on his duty. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, quite a story, quite a life he led crushing even more germs on the Rhine, and humiliating the pigs beyond the wall. Yeah, Constantius uh, Chlorus, uh, Constantius I, is uh, regarded as a capable statesman and an able general. And uh, unfortunately for him, he didn't get to be Augustus very long. Setting a base in the Boracom, modern York, and getting acclaimed as Britannicus Maximus. But Constantius's time was also at an end. Nearing his death, he called upon his soldiers to gather around him and listen to his last wishes. And the words that Constantius then uttered would change Rome and the world forever. That it definitely did. With his father dead, one man rises. One man shall lead Rome to a new era of glory. A man divinely ordained by God himself. That man is... Constantine the Great. Alright, we reached the end of this episode that was great uh, to hear and talk about Diocletian. I'm a fan, as you may have noticed. Although, you know, I didn't agree with everything, of course, there's no perfect emperor out there. But he really dragged Rome back from the brink and gave it a new lease of life. But anyways, uh, that was the end of this video. I'm looking forward to seeing the episode on Constantine the Great and surely his successes, which were not that great. And uh, if you have any more context or comments, please leave them down below. If you liked the video, leave a like. These videos take a lot of time to make, so I would appreciate it. And subscribe for more. We'll get on the next episode soon. And until then, I'll see you later.